a very quick take, I think, is just to repeat something I think we collectively had hashed out before, is that the, the, the reservoir of ideas and inspirations can be uh, broad and even, to, in some people's minds, um, ridiculous, right? That we'll all have different ideas of where that border is. But that's the start and not the conclusion. So if someone wants to, as you say, peddle some strange sounding ideas, they're welcome to. And they're also welcome to try to get funding to do big, hard experiments and convince their intensely aggressive and skeptical colleagues uh, to, to poke and poke and poke and poke, sometimes for decades. And so it's, it's the easy part is saying something weird sounding, right? And the hard part is making parts of that seem to stick even if on the scale of decades, if not forever. And so I think, so I'm, you know, I don't, there are other questions about uh, is there a kind of um, truth in advertising what if this is being peddled not in the pages yeah. of the physics journals but in yeah. you know right. healing or snake oil okay then then I do have concerns about you know limits but if, if the question is you know that person said strange things because it inspired them to say stranger things now if that's the start of an earnest inquiry I, I could live with that personally um, because is, it's not going to stop there is, isn't one of the questions here where we draw the line between pseudoscience and just kind of no, trying to I mean, figure think, stuff out no, I think it's not so much pseudoscience as where do we draw the line between sort of a metaphor, a conceptual yes. metaphor, versus mistaking it for an explanation, mm -hmm. and I think, and meaning, or an explanation for um, the phenomenon, or cause and effect, or you know, um, hijacking, as it were, something that is really um, conceptual um, and a metaphor to action, assigning more, attributing much more to it than just that. Can I would say there's been mm -hmm. three, there's been sort of three, maybe we're ended, there's been two phases of the engagement of, you know, Eastern ideas, Buddhism, classical Indian philosophy, uh, or Hinduism, uh, with science. And the first was, I mean, maybe there's earlier, but the first was sort of this 1970s Fritzdorf Kapper. And I, I loved that book, you know, for the same reason. Yeah. It really introduced yeah. me to quantum mechanics. And the dancing woolly masters. And the dancing woolly masters. Too. And it actually yeah. taught me some interesting things about Buddhism that I didn't know. But it yeah. clearly became then, you know, what the bleep do we know, that ridiculous yeah. movie, you know. Um, and then naturally and thankfully, you know, we moved on where, you know, the interest in Buddhism now turned to where it should have been in science, which is neuroscience. Is right. there something about meditation that may teach right. us about, you know, how to, you know, attentional states, etc. But maybe the third state now is where we begin to pay attention to these philosophies from the other cores of civilization, right? The, uh, the historian Ian West talks about, um, you know, there's the Western core and the Eastern core of the civilization crowd. And there may be ideas there that can be mined about causality and the rela relationship to the absolute and the relative that may be useful for us as we try and deal with the crisis. Can, can you just can, can you just follow up on that? So what might we learn from those Eastern traditions that are not that's not so obvious? Well, like just uh, it's not so much what we're going to learn. We're going to find ideas that may be useful and meaty. And in the end, what's going to matter is whether I get something that leads to a mathematical theory that you know is validated right, that by actually experiment. is applicable. Right. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, so can I make uh, right, two quick comments? One is that we talked a little bit about ways to try to understand the quantum formalism. And w what's needed there, I mean, again, what John Bell would have insisted is it's not fundamentally new ideas. He said, I want the theory to be in the equations and not in the surrounding talk. Mm -hmm. I want yeah. actually a very precisely mm. articulated theory. What we have today is not precisely articulated. So there, that problem is not, I'm looking for a new metaphor. I'm actually just trying to be very, very meticulous mathematically about saying clearly, what am I claiming exists and how does it work, right? How does mm -hmm. it behave? The other problem you have is, well, what if people take the word quantum yeah, I mean. Right. Okay, well, people did this with radium, right? Radioactivity, yes. right? It was right. going to be the elixir of life. They did it with Newton. Wearing radium with belts Newton, yeah. and so on. <laughs> I mean, you can't really blame the people who discovered radioactivity for that. And you blame a bunch of charlatans who took some good science and made a buck out of it, and right. probably gave a lot of people cancer in the in the meantime. Um, so yeah, you need to be very worried if people are throwing the words around and trying to get the patina of science to get you to buy their product. You know, everybody ought to be careful about that. Mm. Well, I just maybe maybe a mild disagreement, Tim. Finally, um, <laughs> <laughs> at this late hour, I, I, I'm hard pressed, at least on uh, uh, right here, on, mm -hmm. off the cuff, to think of a single instance, literally a single instance, over the last whether one or seven centuries, we, you, you can mm -hmm. determine the boundaries, um, in which people had finally come to agree on the math says this, and therefore the interpretation is un unambiguous and unavoidable. And that's even for equations that haven't changed in 100 years. So if you look at as things you know extremely well, better than me, uh, interpretation 
equations of subtle things in general relativity, we haven't changed or tinkered with the field equations of Einstein's beautiful theory of gravity. And that Einstein himself and dozens of really smart people who won Nobel Prizes had this pendulum swing back right. looking at the same equation saying, what does that mean? Right. Not just quantum no, mechanics. No, no. Right? I, I, so we don't actually disagree. I'm not saying oh, that the mathematics is not <laughs> self-interpreting. No, that's what I'm trying to get. But that's if right. you don't have right. clear mathematics, you don't even have the basis for what you now need yes. to go on to understand what the math is. Well, that's why his concern right, right. is but, not so. But the metaphor <laughs> comes before the mathematics. Right might come before the mathematics right. at a certain stage in some problems, right? right? And that's the utility of right. other ways of thinking. I mean, we talked about that. There yeah. could be heuristic utility, utility from anywhere. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. right. Then right. you want that heuristic, the theory to be nailed down mathematically, but that doesn't finish okay. the problem. problem. This is, you're no. right. Yeah. Even when I, in some sense, can have some clear mathematics, but there can still be disputes about exactly right. how to interpret it. And that's why none of us on this panel will be out of work, right? That's because <laughs> right. There, there, there is a continuing, I mean, genuinely a continuing, you know, philosophical work to be done. Right. I don't think the, I don't think the interpretational matters are any more finished than, say, the sort of calculational right. ones matters. are. Right.